What is the role of a civil engineer in public works? And how can a civil engineer transition from the private sector into the public sector and still be confident in their abilities? Well, in this week's episode, I have with me Matthew Douglas. Matthew is a public works operation manager for a city in Texas. And he's going to share with us his story of how he made that transition and how he's really enjoying what he does in public works. Let's jump right in. All right, now it's time for our civil engineering conversation of the week. And I have with me our guest for today, Matthew Douglas, Public Works Operations Manager at the city of Sugarland. Matthew, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. And so just to kick us off here, Matt, in your own words, tell our listeners a little bit about your career journey up to date and kind of how you got into public works. Uh, well, uh, right now, in my fourth year working for the city of Sugarland, um, I started off doing some design engineering in the water resources uh, sector, um, more so like streamline restoration, um, you know, stormwater BMPs uh, back in Baltimore. Then I moved out here to Texas um, around the Houston area, and now I've been working at Public Works ever since. So you started in private consulting and then made that mm -hmm. transition to Public Works. Talk us through that right. decision making process a little bit, Matt. Uh, well, it was a conversation that I had with my wife with that. And, uh, you know, we were wanting to move, wanting a little change, wanting to step up. And um, I saw an opportunity, um, you know, to work with the city of Sugarland. Um, so I took it. Um, interview went great. Got it. Uh, pretty much immediately. And uh, since then, I've been working uh, within water utilities, and then I hopped over to the streets and drainage side of uh, public works. Um, so with that career change, um, I basically went from design to more of like a managerial role, um, where now I'm just uh, pretty much managing projects. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Interesting. So did you first decide that you were going to relocate to this geographic region of the country and then look for a job in public works? Or did you say, let me just look and see where jobs are? I decided that we were, well, we decided that we were going to move to the Houston area first. And then I said, well, um, I would like to kind of go into like the government side of things. So that was always kind of like my, you know, like the top of my list. Um, I saw an opportunity. I took it. Um, I did apply to some other uh, opportunities out in this area as well, um, but they responded the fastest and uh, the opportunity looked great. I thought it was a, a great chance for me to get, you know, right where I needed to be. Um, you know, I love the, uh, the structure, the stability. Um, and it was also just a change from, you know, design engineering. Um, I didn't want to just sit behind a desk most of the time. Um, I like to be more active. Um, so I went for it. That's great. And just so people are clear on kind of your role, you are, mm -hmm. you're managing or overseeing the construction side of projects and you're visiting sites mm -hmm. and stuff like that, correct? Correct, correct. All right, so Correct. It's more interactive, not just sitting, like you said, designing. You actually have to get out there in the field, see things being built, making sure that things are being built, I guess, the way they're supposed to be built. Correct. I mean, like there is, uh, we go through all of the phases. I mean, like we, uh, I'm usually the person that sets the scope. I looked at all the problems that we have. I uh, uh, control all of the assessments that we do. Um, and then I will actually uh, uh, get my contractors or, um, you know, my projects started. And um, then we'll coordinate all of the inspections and make sure that everything is done correctly. That's great. So just before we dive a little bit more into that, into a little more detail, let's talk about public works in general. For those listening mm -hmm. that aren't that familiar with what public works is and you know why, why might a civil engineer get involved in that? What is public works? Well, actually, I have an official definition from the American uh, Public Works Association uh, because public works is so vast that there's not like one general general definition but uh, APWA defines it as uh, public works is the combination of physical assets management practices policies and personnel necessary for government to provide and sustain structures and services essential to the welfare and acceptable quality of life for citizens pretty long definition the way that I think about it is uh, basically just the management and operations of um, all of a city's public infrastructure uh, within a governed area 
um, for the use of the public. Um, so, I mean, that's everything, your drainage systems, your sidewalks, your roads, your bridges, um, all of those things are public works. Wow. So you could imagine that depending on the size of a city or a town or a village or municipality, there mm -hmm. could be a, a very large, potentially public works department. Exactly. A small one as well, of course. But mm -hmm. so talk to us about what you do in your role at public works, the types of projects you mentioned it a little bit, but some of the more data mm -hmm. stuff, if someone out there, a listener is thinking, Hey, I might want to get into public works. Give us mm -hmm. a little feel for what a, a couple of days might look like for you in terms of the types of things you're doing. Well, it kind of depends. So uh, sometimes we have uh, uh, directors from the, um, uh, from the higher ups, like our city council, our city managers, our directors, um, where we have a certain goal that we're trying to achieve within a couple of years. Um, for us specifically, um, it might be just reducing the, the amount of structural flooding that we have in our streets, um, you know, to give a better quality of life to the residents of the city. Um, so that will basically uh, call for us to do a study with our engineering department and see, okay, what can we possibly do to improve the drainage systems within the city? Um, for us, that was changing over inlets. Um, you know, instead of having uh, rollback curb inlets or graded inlets, we would uh, change them to type C inlets. So now we uh, do an assessment to see, okay, exactly how many inlets of these certain types do we have within the city? How can we change it? How much is it gonna cost? What kind of contractor are we gonna use? Um, you know, we pair that with our city standards, we get that contract executed. Um, another side that we uh, typically use is uh, just responding to public comments um, and issues. Uh, another big thing that we have is our sidewalk contract, um, where a lot of the residents will um, issue a service request or a complaint about um, a sidewalk section not exactly being to their standard. Um, we'll go and investigate that through methods of an assessment and um, we'll determine, okay, what level of uh, reconstruction is actually needed here? Do we need the whole sidewalk section to be redone? Do we need just a patch? Do we need um, a temporary solution? Whatever it is, we'll find that and then we'll allocate that to the specific project that is used to fix that problem. So what I'm hearing you say, Matt, is that you could be involved with talking with citizens on a daily basis or residents. You could be dealing with board mm -hmm. members of the right. municipality. You know, you could be dealing with um, other consultants, outside design consultants, private consultants that might be working on the project. Yes. So it sounds like a big part of this job is a lot of communication on a lot of different types of projects. Exactly. Exactly. I think that uh, especially when you get to the mid-level management level, um, you have to be a great communicator because you have to talk to uh, the people that you take orders from and the people that you do work for. Uh, so being a person that can, you know, double up and uh, know exactly how our construction processes go while also being able to explain it um, to people that may not know exactly how they go um, is very, very important. Uh, but also having uh, the field experience to be able to tell exactly what's happening and to be able to um, actually run the data and run the assessments on that data as well um, is very, very important. So you kind of have to be a jack of all trades at Public Works. Right, which let's go back a little bit on that. I want to dig a little deeper on that because this is, this is interesting to me. So you, when did you graduate with your engineering degree? 2016. 2016. Okay, so mm -hmm. six years ago, you did some work right. in the Baltimore area, like you mentioned, you worked for a private firm, and then you made the decision to relocate to Texas. Mm -hmm. How did you, at such a young age, right, not working in government at all, be confident enough to get involved in these types of projects now where you're dealing with, you know, board members, you're dealing with citizens, like, did you go through a training? Was it just like you got thrown on the job and you had people that are teaching you? Yeah. How did that process look? Because I can imagine someone sitting here listening to us saying, I don't know if I could make that jump and be confident uh, in that. Well, uh, interestingly enough, I was pretty much just thrown into the fire. <laughs> um, so when I first got here, I started off as an engineer one. And when I did, it was an engineer one within the public works um, department. With that, I was an engineer one with water utilities. So I was managing all of the water utilities contracts and projects that they have, all of the rehabilitation projects. 
then there was an opportunity for me to move over to the streets and drainage side, which is um, like the larger construction projects that we have. I took that opportunity. I applied for it. I got that. And now here I am uh, four years after my start, um, you know, with uh, City of Sugarland. Um, so that's how I kind of just moved up so quickly because, um, you know, I just saw an opportunity and I took it and uh, I think I'm doing pretty well with it so far. <laughs> That's great. No, it sounds like yeah. you are. And it sounds like, you know, and I just commend you for making such a big, I mean, <clears throat> when you talk about a transition, I mean, you relocated obviously to a completely different part of the country to begin with. Then you got mm -hmm. involved in a completely different aspect of civil engineering and, you know, right. you jump into it. So let, let's talk about that a little bit in terms of public works and kind of the career path or the career opportunities for in, in uh, public works for civil engineering professionals. It sounds like there there may be quite a few different career opportunities or different things you can do within public works as a civil engineer. Can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, well, I mean, there's a bunch of things. So you can either stay on the rehabilitation side. You can do uh, the general construction work, which would you would be classified as a general maintenance worker. Um, you can be a field supervisor, a crew chief, a superintendent. You can be uh, a landscaper. Um, you can be a project manager, uh, engineering manager, uh, senior engineering manager, assistant director. There's so many different things that you do uh, just within uh, this division. And this division in, for this city, like it's not exactly uh, cut and pasted to every single municipality across the country. Um, a lot of other departments and other municipalities will have like solid waste, um, environmental services all of those things in combination within their public works department. So there's so many different avenues that you can go into. Um, and I'm just thinking about the, uh, the topics that I covered back uh, from my undergraduate degree. Uh, we covered uh, water resources, water quality, structural engineering, uh, mechanics of materials, um, just a bunch of stuff. Like all, <laughs> you know? A lot of it is in public works. Yeah. And you can see a lot. Exactly. Of works. Exactly. So going back, a minute when you talked about the types of projects so rehabilitation being obviously if there's an old, some something old that you're rehabilitating redeveloping something along those lines could be one aspect of a project that you can work on but then you could also get into the construction side of things where once that takes place you're out there on the site like you are so so kind of right. like what it sounds like is you can kind of work in a lot of different aspects of civil engineering under a public works umbrella depending on what you mm -hmm. like Exactly. And the reason why I like it so much is because you get that exposure to pretty much all of the different branches of civil engineering with some regard, um, but it's more like a high level view of things. You're not in the nitty gritty of like, uh, you know, coming up with the design and, you know, calculations and the, uh, the CAD drawings, like you're not doing all of those um, small parts in order to build up to the big picture. You're looking at the big picture. This is the problem. How are we going to solve it? You figure it out and then you just get it done from there. Um, it's more of like a management slash operations view of civil engineering, which is, it just aligns with my strengths a little bit better. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think that, you know, traditionally on this show, of course, we've interviewed a lot of civil engineers in private practice and we've gotten some requests for some more, you know, episodes dedicated to the public side of things. Mm -hmm. government work, government opportunities. And we recently had Kara Boyles on, who's the city engineer in South Bend, Indiana. So if those of you out there are interested in, again, learning more about public works, she gave some great examples of specific projects they're working on. Matt's talking to us a little bit more overview of like what public works is. So we definitely are trying to create some more content because we know that some of our listeners are interested in getting into this field. And Matt, I would imagine that your first job in private industry really helped you in terms of preparing you for something like this. It did. It helped my mindset a little bit better. Um, not going to lie, I was definitely like still in the uh, college mindset when I was leaving, uh, you know, from university. Um, getting into the flow of work was definitely a transition, definitely a change. Um, but it was helpful um, just actually being able to understand and getting like the, the fundamentals of things. I mean, you know, yes, you you know, look at plan sets, you look at CAD drawings, you learn certain things when you're uh, in college, but actually getting that real world experience and seeing like how timing really goes into everything um, and how on the private side, like projects are broken down um, 
and then going over to the government side of the fence and seeing like how we actually administer those projects it just makes like a huge uh, uh kind of like makes like a storybook really where you can kind of see like how the whole entire process is put together. Yeah. And I would imagine you still deal with private consultants on some of your projects. Yeah. And now, now you understand their mindset. Exactly. Exactly. You know, funny thing is that when I was actually on the private side, uh, they always used to say that government workers aren't doing anything in their offices. We're just, you know, pushing pencils and stuff. And I'm just like, uh, I don't think so. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah, no, I've, I've had the chance to talk to Matt a few times and he's always keeping busy going on sites, talking to people that he's overseeing. It's a very busy job, it sounds like, and there's a lot thrown at Matt. And it sounds, quite frankly, like it's a challenging job, Matt, which in my opinion, you have a challenging job with a lot of responsibilities that keeps things interesting. It does keep things very, very interesting. There's always something to learn. Um, I would say that I've learned, like every year that I've been here, I've learned more than I have the previous year. Um, I've gotten more responsibilities than the previous year. Um, pretty much they just give me a whole bunch of money to spend and I have to find a way to spend it on my project. So that forces me to learn a lot. Uh, so it's pretty good. It's yeah, pretty no, good. Awesome. And I think especially like for someone like yourself who's young in your career, you're probably ex getting exposed right now to a lot mm -hmm. of different things. And, you know, whatever the future may hold for you, it may hold, but you have a lot of knowledge that you've built up now in different areas of civil engineering, which could be beneficial depending on, you know, where you are yeah. in your career. And I would imagine in terms of like a civil engineer's role in public works, it's kind of like whatever you want to do as a civil engineer. Cause like you rattled off mm -hmm. all the different types of projects you could work in. If you're a civil engineer, you could probably do any of those things. So really like right. fit in anywhere. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, as long as you have that background knowledge, you can kind of just go everywhere. Um, I mean, like I said before, public works is just more so broad, you know, depending on the level where you are. Um, if you're working on the water utility side, you're just working, maybe you can work in a lab, uh, you know, testing out um, uh, water quality, making the water clean for the residents of the city that you're working in. Uh, maybe you're working on, you know, like a, a pipe design, um, you know, maybe you're working on like manhole designs or pavement designs, whatever it is, but just getting a general overview and seeing how those projects are actually really coming to light when you're on the public work side. Yeah, that's great. And I think what, what I like about the idea of public works for a civil engineer, let's say, for example, mm -hmm. is flexibility. You know, I think right. in your career having flexibility is really important. I have a daughter right now who's in high school and she's starting to think about like colleges and careers and I'm looking at some stuff with her. And she was looking mm -hmm. at maybe the possibility of becoming a physical therapist and to become a physical therapist, you have to get a license. And, and with that license, you can do a million things. You can work in sports medicine, right. senior right. care, work with pediatrics. And what I was trying to tell her is like, what I really like about what I've seen from this so far is it's flexible. So when you get a license mm -hmm. and you get out there and you start working, you can decide between a lot of different fields under that one umbrella of a license, which to me is very similar to civil engineering. And and mm -hmm. what I like about, but even with civil engineering though, if you go to work for a company, let's say a small company, you may only be able to do one type of thing if they only offer one type of service, but it seems like in public works, because there's so many different components of a town, like you mentioned before, in the infrastructure, you can kind of do a lot of things and stay with one organization for a long time. Exactly, giving you a bunch of different exposures, um, which makes it so that if you were to leave from that organization, you can speak on a lot of different things uh, for a lot of different civil engineering uh, firms, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. I guess you prepped. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so a couple of questions I want to ask you about public works that you mentioned before. You mentioned earlier, like in that definition you were reading, a couple of different components of public works, one being project management and one being asset management. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about those two terms, what they entail for those out there, again, might be considering this? Well, uh, I would say that those are probably the two of the biggest components in you know, public works. I mean, I think that my municipality in particular is not just the typical one. We're not just being uh, uh, reactive to problems that we have. We're trying to get more on that proactive side and that requires a certain amount of asset management and project management. Uh, for example, we are actually trying to uh, implement um, um, drainage improvement uh, studies, projects, um, 
all of those things. So what we what we'll do is actually do assessments, and with that. That will actually um, gather a list of contractors or a list of projects where we're actually televising um, and inspecting our actual uh, storm sewer lines that we have within the city. Um, that actually gives us a list of all of the defects or problems that we might have within the city. And we can actually take that data and we can determine, OK, what are we going to do about this? Are we going to um, you know, cure in place? Are we going to pipe blast? What are we going to do? Um, but that ties in uh, so hugely into asset management because knowing the assets that you have within a city, knowing exactly what the components are, like when it was installed, what the useful life is, um, what kind of um, actual uh, uh, material it actually is. Um, and again, that goes back to the mechanics of materials because when you know those things, you can actually make um, um, estimations on how much it's going to cost for you to replace that item. Um, you know, what kind of contractor you're going to use, what kind of materials you're going to use to replace it with, um, you know, how it can typically break. Uh, for example, like if it's a, a HDPE pipe versus a concrete pipe, you already know that an HDPE pipe is probably not going to crack the same exact way that a concrete pipe will. A concrete pipe is probably going to crack at like, you know, at a, a 12 and six or at a, you know, a, a what, a three and a nine um, on a clock. Of course, I'm speaking more technical terms here. Whereas an HEPE pipe might just bend or flex because it's plastic. Um, that's really what how asset management really plays a huge part because it can help us so that we can make better data driven decisions um, so that we can move forward and become more proactive with all of the assets that we have within the city. But of course, I mean, that ties into project management as well. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of rambling right now, but. No, it's, um, <laughs> what you're saying is helpful. I mean, basically you have project management, which I'm sure a lot of our listeners heard of, right? Scope, schedule, budget. Right. You're managing those different important components of one project um, that, right. may, that may take a year, two years, five years, whatever the case may be. Matt gave us an example before, like sidewalk project you might be working on, you know, managing that project. Asset management, I think looking at a bigger picture of an asset in terms of the lifeline of it, and what's involved for that. And I think one example I can give you or analogy as a personal analogy could be like your car, right? If you have a car, mm -hmm. you got to keep track of when did I get the tires changed? When did I get an oil change? When do I need to get a timing belt at 100,000 miles or whatever the case may be? So you're able to make sure you keep that car in good shape and you can keep it as long as you can. Well, just imagine that now on a bridge or, you know, on mm -hmm. a roadway or something like that, or a stormwater system where you need to really understand you know, the life cycle of that project and how, you, you know, it's your responsibility as a public works department to kind of maintain these different assets for the town. So you can obviously see how many different exciting things could go into this from a civil engineer's perspective, for sure. And, and I guess one of the last things that I'll ask you about public works, Matt, is how can someone learn more about it? Like someone listens to this and said, hey, I want to get, maybe want to get more into this. I like what I've heard here from Matt. Is there you know, resources or somewhere where you can learn more about public works? I would definitely say um, AWWA um, and APWA are going to be two of your biggest resources. Um, YouTube is also a great resource for, for me as well. I mean, uh, you know, I stand by it. Um, just getting on and just typing up certain things like, uh, you know, how do you replace a road? How do you replace a storm drain? How do you replace a sidewalk? And just like finding out exactly what components go into that is extremely important because if you don't know what's going on, how can you actually manage somebody that is doing it? You know, you, you don't really know what you're talking about. Um, I think that those are great resources. Uh, Google is also a great resource too. Um, you know, your, your PE handbook is also going to be a great reference for you as well. Um, you know, just taking the time to study those things and just getting your feet wet. I think that um, just getting into any city or municipality in the public works department, you're going to end up learning something. Um, asking questions to people that are in higher positions than you are and just, you know, letting them take you under their wing is extremely pivotal. That's actually what helped me a lot um, because I was never the humble type. Well, never the, uh, uh, the type that was uh, not humble enough to go and ask somebody for help or for guidance or um, for learning. Um, you know, along with my role in streets and drainage, there's the uh, superintendent, there's the right-of-way services manager that we have here. 
I can stand to learn about, you know, beautification and landscaping and um, how to actually like, you know, uh, control field staff and, you know, uh, making different SOPs and uh, uh, levels of service that we um, that we adhere to. Um, learning about, you know, different GIS tactics and all those things. Um, so, yeah, you can learn a lot from just people that you work with um, here. No, yeah. for sure. I mean, I think finding a mentor, even informally, just someone that can teach you on a regular basis is good, I think, in any line of work. And I think that whenever you start a new career or a new job in your career, just having that mentality of being a sponge, you know, asking questions, soaking up whatever information you can, I think is a great approach. Right. One thing that I like that Matt said there is the idea of YouTube, like getting on and looking up, you know, videos and learning, because I think one of the challenges that I could see for someone who's a civil engineer, let's say in the private sector, and they want to make that leap to public works or into the government side of things, one of the challenges that might hold them back would be, but I don't really know that much about a lot of things in public works, right? However, if you take that leap and you say, I'm committed to learning on the job, you can still learn all this stuff. I mean, Matt didn't know everything about all these different things when he decided to relocate across the country and take a job in government. So as a matter of fact, I didn't know anything. Okay, So, <laughs> so which is the point, which is that if you're sitting right. and listening to this podcast episode, because you're interested in getting into public works, we don't want you to hear about all this stuff in public works and say, Oh my gosh, I can't make that move. I don't know any of that stuff. Well, like Matt said, just said, he didn't know any of it either, but he had the background in civil engineering. He'd been exposed to some stuff through design, and he was able to then take that, find mentors there, get on YouTube, read books, whatever he had to do, and learn it. And so I think that's a big takeaway from the episode today is that we're here to show you what the public works opportunity may look like for civil engineers. It doesn't mean that you need to have a certain skill level just to get into the ball game because you don't necessarily need to do that. So I think that that's an important takeaway. So what we're going to do here, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to wrap up by putting Matt on the civil engineering hot seat. We'll be right back. All right, we're back with Matthew Douglas, Public Works Operations Manager at the city of Sugarland, And now we're going to put Matt on the civil engineering hot seat. Ready to go, Matt? Yep, ready to go. All right. So do you have any specific rituals that you practice every day? For example, do you have a specific morning routine or a lunchtime routine? Just something that you do consistently on a daily basis that contributes to your success as a profession? Uh, so a couple things. Um, eat breakfast, drink a lot of water. Um, I try to get at least 10 to 30 minutes of exercise every single day if I can, um, if I'm not too busy enough. <laughs> uh and drink coffee definitely drink coffee <laughs> all right so maybe that exercise comes in the forms of walking around construction sites but nonetheless you'll get exercise right yeah right right exactly exactly got to be active um it keeps you sharp um you know sometimes i'll even just stand up on my desk or something and you know do a couple squats or something when nobody's looking so i don't look too weird <laughs> you know try to stay awake you know got stay you. sharp all right good so keeping your your body and, and then your mind sharp that's good so yeah. Next one here is, is there a book that you might recommend to our listeners or a book that you found to be extremely helpful in your personal and professional development? Maybe one that maybe stood out for you? I think of one. Um, I would say, what is it called? Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Um, that was probably one of my favorite ones. Um, I think that it just kind of just aligned to like how I think about taking the uh, proactive approach and, you know, kind of just uh, 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 taking things for what they are, you know, right now, doing what you can with where you are at. I mean, it kind of speaks to um, how I even got started in this career. I didn't have anything when I started up, but, you know, I started learning over time. I got a mentor for for, you know, and I started learning uh, from them over time with what I actually had. Um, and it helped me tremendously. Yeah, no, that's great. I think the seven habits book is often cited as by engineers, I think for a number of reasons. One, we like frameworks, right? It gives you like a really good framework that you can kind of apply. And I do think you could take the habits even one at a time if you want to implement them into your life, which I think makes it a book that's very memorable to people because it helps drive real change, which I think is what you want to, try to accomplish with any kind of content. 
All right. So I know you're young in your career, but thinking about the managers that you've had so far, and you don't have to name names, of course, but just thinking about your favorite managers or the managers you worked with, you know, what made them your favorite? Like we're trying to understand here in the world of engineering, you know, what are some of the characteristics of really good managers from your perspective? Well, characteristics. Um, well, first I would say that my favorite manager was, uh, my first assistant director of streets and drainage when I got started in this current role. The reason why he was my favorite was because he was challenging, but also was not a micromanager at the same exact time. He would challenge you to think outside the box. And um, at the same time, he would allow for you to just like think free reign and say like, hey, well, come up with an idea. Let me know something like, how do you think that we should actually take care of this problem? And it really got me to thinking like, okay, like, what do I do in this situation? Who can I ask for help? Um, I would say that that kind of aligned with, uh, with my strengths a little bit more. And it, I've kind of taken uh, his management style and kind of like made that part of my own as well. Um, because I like that. I think that, you know, um, people, uh, especially when they're trying to level up in their career, need to be given um, that option to be able to practice their own things and make their own hard decisions, whether it's going to be right or wrong. They're supposed to learn from those things. Um, so, yeah, that really resonated with me very, very well. That's awesome. I mean, I think the idea of challenging someone as a manager, but then giving them a bit of a leash to kind of figure things out, like you said, and not stand over their shoulder is a great way to number one, make people feel good because if your manager is challenging you, then that means that he or she must believe in your abilities. But then at the same mm -hmm. time, they're also giving you the leash to kind of, cause they feel like they, they think you can get it done on your own and you don't need like babysitting. Right. Right so I think that that's mm -hmm. a very good combination for a manager. And I could see why, you know, you could remember that, you know, as, as being one of your favorites for sure. Right. All right, so I've got one final question for you, and we call it the civil engineering career elevator advice question. If you got into an elevator with a civil engineer, maybe student, recent graduate, someone who's you know early on in their career, and you had 30 to 40 seconds with him or her, what is one piece of career advice that you might give to that young civil engineering professional based on your career experience so far, if you had like 30 to 40 seconds? I would say that you have to find a way to blend passion and persistence together. Um, you can't just be in a job just to be in a job. You have to find some type of way to be passionate about that thing. Find some type of meaning behind it. When you find a meaning behind it, it doesn't really seem like it's work. You won't drag through the day-to-day -day activities that you're going through. Um, that's all I would really have to say. Yeah, I, mean, I think that that's pretty good <laughs> advice in 30, 40 seconds, right? Find something you're passionate about, but then also be persistent at it. You know, keep going, keep driving every day. I think that's great. So Matt, thanks so much for spending some time with us on the Civil Engineering Podcast, sharing your story and your transition. It's been a pleasure. Which, which I know is something that a lot of people are interested in. Um, we'll, we'll give you information below this video so you can follow up on it and do some research in some of those outlets if you're interested. But Matt, thanks again for coming on the podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you guys for your time. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Matt. What I really like about it is how he talked about how anyone in civil engineering can make the transition. You don't have to transition into public works and know everything. You can learn a lot on the job if you have a good solid background. However, there's a lot of flexibility in the government work and it's not as boring as a lot of people might say. People say, hey, government employees, they don't work. The jobs are boring. You can see from Matt that that's not the case. So if you're a civil engineer, you've got options. And I hope that this video helped you to uncover another option for you. Please consider subscribing to our channel here. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better managers and leaders. We'll see you next week.